Welcome to chapter 15, health, well-being, and resilience. In this chapter, there will be five videos representing the five major sections of the chapter shown here in these five learning questions. <laughs> so we're going to start with this first one, what is stress and how do we cope with it? And so we can define stress as anything that places excessive demands on our ability on our ability to cope um i mean normal demands are fine we, we all have demands on our abilities on a daily basis but m most of the time there there are demands that we know we can cope with so it only becomes something becomes stressful when it feels like you know you might not be successful at it or it feels like it's too much then it becomes very stressful uh we have a built-in fight or flight response and this helps us for short-term threats um we it, our fight or flight response you know prepares us for action um prepares us to handle short-term threats and so it's an automatic response system. But it turns out that it's quite exhausting on the body for long-term stress. It wears you down physically and it wears down your stress response system if it's at, too active for too long. Let's watch a short video, just a couple minutes, where it talks about this a little bit. Okay, so going to that video to do, do, do here we go okay so this talks about toxic stress ongoing stressful con conditions for young children learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development when experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert in the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. Okay, so this video points out that uh, ongoing stress, or what we call toxic stress, can have lifelong effects on a developing individual. We're going to look at, into that a little bit more when we get to the next slide. Uh, we're, we'll start to look at it now, actually. Uh, so researchers, as I said here, have found that as a number of adverse experiences, uh, and these are known as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, as the number of them increases during childhood, early childhood, uh, so does the negative impact they'll have on a person's health and well-being. So there's, a, there's an, additive effect you know the more adverse childhood experiences you have or the more prolonged they are the more permanent damage uh, can be done to the, to the 
to the system. Um, so you see at the bottom of this pyramid are the adverse childhood experiences. This would include such things as uh, psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, living with, with substance abusers, living with mentally ill people, uh, living with people that have, been, that have been in prison before, uh, also witnessing domestic violence in the home. These are, you know, these are some of the major types of adverse childhood experiences. There are certainly more, you know, that you could probably think of. I mean, growing up in a war zone, for, for instance, would be an, a war zone would be an adverse childhood experience. So anyways, if there is an abundance of adverse childhood experiences that, that are prolonged, um, moving up the pyramid, it can, it can result in disrupted neural development. Um, in the in the video talked about this, I mean, it, it mentioned that your stress response system may, may become, you know, um, on may may become on high alert. So in some cases, the neurological system becomes what overreactive is a word we use, where you know the child starts reacting to every little stressor with with a full bolt blown, you know, fight or flight response. And so so that would be an overreactive neurological system. Um, in other cases, the their neurological fight or flight response system may may be slow to shut down, meaning, you know, when they experience a normal stressor and, and they their body reacts to it, they stay on high alert. You know, the 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 system keeps um keeps reacting for much longer even after the threat has disappeared. Um, Anyways, in, in both cases, you know, this kind of disrupted neural development um, of, of the stress response system can lead to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Uh, just as one example, um, it's quite possible that the child will become overly anxious and fearful um, because they, they get so used to, you know, um, showing these stress responses all the time that it, it affects, you know, their personality and, and how they view the world and how they react to things. Um, these social, emotional, and cognitive impairments make it more likely that as the individual's aging, uh, that they will eventually adopt high-risk behaviors like, you know, drug or alcohol abuse, smoking, ha having numerous sexual partners, overeating, and the adoption of health risk behaviors like that can lead to, you know, serious disease, disability, and social problems like alcoholism, drug addiction, depression, uh, severe obesity, heart, lung, or liver diseases, cancer, AIDS. I mean, like, so, and this is, this is kind of like, you know, this moving from the bottom to top, I mean, these adverse childhood experiences may have happened, you know, just even in the first few years of life, but it 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 has this ripple effect that's going to continue throughout development with the as a because it disrupts your neural development and it causes social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. It those often cause a person to adopt the health risk behaviors. They lead to problems and disease and disabilities, and eventually, then because of these problems, it, early death is much more likely. Um, and that early death, you know, can quite likely be from, uh, be caused by one of these diseases that they de de developed or one of these social problems. Or, and you know, there's, a, there's also a higher risk of suicide among people that, you know, fit this pattern. So what, the, what they're pointing out in, the, in that video is, is that, you know, even when the problems stop, you know, maybe a child experiences a few years of adverse childhood experiences and, and it's like, oh, now we've got them into a better situation. I mean, it does not solve the problem because of this, this ripple effect that we're seeing here. One thing leads to another, which leads to another. And, and so even though you stop the immediate stressful conditions, maybe the damage is already done. They've had the disruptive neural development. They've, they've got impairments. 
this, you know, they're more likely to in, engage in health, 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 you, health risk behaviors, excuse me, et cetera. Okay. Going on here. Um, so we talk about two different types of stress in, de in developmental psychology. Normative stress is just, is just caused by things that happen to most people. So it's normal stress. Um, it's often things that we can prepare for. In many cases, we know ahead of time when these stressful events are approaching because, you know, some of them are on a timetable. Um, and so normative stress typically does not overwhelm our ability to cope. It's expected stress. So there should be events like starting kindergarten for a young child. It's stressful for them, but, you know, we, the parents know it's coming, the, the child's prepared ahead of time. Um, starting middle school, you know, starting college, um, going through puberty is a, is a normative stressful event. Once again, you know approximately when it's going to occur. You can kind of prepare for it. It's stressful, but you typically does not overwhelm us. Um, a couple of other ones, learning to drive is, is, normative, is considered normative stress. Uh, dating someone you like, let's face it, if anyone is, you know, remembers the first time you start dating, it's very stressful. But it's a normal part of development and growing up. Basically, everyone goes, almost everyone goes through these types of stressors. All right, what really gets us are, are the non-normative stressors. The experience of unusual and unexpected distressing events that may overwhelm us because of their magnitude and their unexpectedness. Um, these are relatively rare occurrences that, that few people need to deal with. Um, and, and this would include things like the death of a parent, um, having a serious illness and, and extended hospitalization, uh, living through a natural disaster, and things like that. Uh, and so it is this non-normative stress that, that can cause the most damage because once again, it, it, these are the types of things that strike out of the blue, no one's expecting them, they just suddenly happen in many cases. And so they, they can overwhelm the system. And if you have, you know, multiple non-normative non stressful events, then you, you know, it puts a, a developing child at risk. Okay, um, let's look at coping, which is the conscious effort we make to relegate, regulate, excuse me, our emotions, thoughts, and behaviors when we're challenged by stressful situations. Um, we, talk, we talk about two different types of of cope, coping strategies, problem focused versus emotion focused. Uh, there is a table I'll, I'll point out on um, on page 583, table 15.1. It lists a, a number of, of strategies of each of these types. So it, it's a good table to review. Um, I'll mention, just mention one type of problem focused strategy that's in that chart there. It's called active coping. It's very good type of problem focused strategy. It's, it, you know, where you take, you're directly taking action in order to try to remove the source of the stress or, or to soften its effect. So you're kind of taking, you're attacking the problem head on. If you, if active coping works, you can get rid of the stressor. And, and so you eliminate the stress and don't have to deal with it anymore. Um, Emotion focused strategies just focus on reducing our response to, to a stressor. So we, you know, we manage our feelings and, and do things to, to make ourselves feel better about it, even though it doesn't eliminate the stressor. So this might be like venting your feelings. Some people, when they're in distress, the maybe they go work out, for instance, or they just go and, and talk to their best friend or, 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 their, or a parent about their feelings. Um, seeking emotional support from others is, is common. Um, you know, this would include also, you know, talking to your to a friend. Um, some 
even something like it's just deciding to accept the situation, you know, if you believe that there's nothing you can do about it, accepting the situation actually will reduce the, the stress of it somewhat. If you feel like I got to do something, I got to do something, then it, it's going to keep bothering you. But if you say, okay, I can live with this, or I, I can accept this um, this stressor until it, you know until it disappears, or um, and and that actually you know will help your emotions somewhat once you've made that decision. Um, generally speaking, we we would you know it's certainly recommended that the prompt focus strategies that can eliminate the threat or or you know soften its impact are, are better in the long term. But sometimes we we just we're just not up to tackling problems head on, and so the emotion focused strategies can be like a bridge. It can maybe we can use them for a while until we feel ready to tackle the problem head on. Um, just to give you an example, uh, um, you know, like let's say somebody started uh, you started a new job, you've been there for a little while, and and you don't really know how your performance is. Like you, may, you know, there are certain types of jobs where we don't, where you might not get a lot of feedback. And it's like, you know, am, am I doing well? Am I doing poorly? I really don't know. And and that can cause stress. That can be a stressful event for somebody. It's like, you know, you you don't know if you have to work harder or change your work. Or, and so, like an uh, uh, an active coping problem focused strategy would be, you know, to to go and approach. Though your your boss and then to directly ask them about your performance and and to make sure that this doesn't keep happening, maybe you ask them for a a monthly check in. Hey, can we talk about my? Can we meet once a month to, just to talk about how I'm doing at the job? And 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 you know if if they agree to this, this is going to give you kind of an outlet. Where you can stop you can stop stressing because you know every month you're going to find out how you're doing. You can make any changes you need to. Um. Emotion focused strategies in that situation might be things like like talking to your coworkers. How do you think I'm doing? You know, and and that if they if they're supportive, it's gonna make you feel better, but you still aren't gonna really know. You haven't get you haven't gotten rid of the actual problem, but you'll probably feel better if they're supportive of you. Um uh, you might make a list of things you could do. Some people do that. This is one strategy that you know a lot of people use. They, they, there's something that Bothering them, they make a list of what they could do, and they actually feel better by making a list, um, even though they may not do anything on the list. If you actually start to do the things on the list, then you you you're moving from emotion focused to problem focused. But the actually making the list doesn't actually accomplish anything, so it's still emotion focused at that point. Um, maybe you just decide once again to to accept the situation. Maybe there is a yearly review, and you say, okay, I'm going to wait. So my yearly review comes up half a year from now or whenever you know it might be, and uh, I'll just I'll just keep doing what I'm doing until then, and, and and not worry about it anymore, and and I'll find out at you know at the yearly review, and and so once again it's it it's something that might make you feel you know once you accept that you you might start you might not be as stressed. Uh, so anyways, there's um these are two very different types of, of of coping strategies. Um, they say that like young children, uh, they're more likely to actually re rely upon problem-focused strategies uh, because young children often don't know how to use emotion-focused strategies. They haven't really, those develop with time as we do, as we grow. We we start to learn how to control our emotions better and how to do things to make us feel better and. So I, actually, very young children often they want to, when they are under stress, they want to attack it head on, and, and, and which which can be a very good thing. Um, um, if they do use emotion focused strategies, they tend to be very simple, direct um, uh, strategies that temporarily make them feel better, like like sucking their thumb or clinging to a favorite blanket or something like that. Um, Okay. Uh, ways to help children cope with stress. Um, well, in order to help them, first of all, we have to recognize when they're under stress. And to do this, you know, you you need to pay attention to changes in their behaviors. And this is this is the most you know sure sign that 
that there's something bothering them is that the behavior changes radically, radically in some way. There's some examples mentioned here, like a regression to earlier behaviors. So, you know, a, a child that's, that, you know, solved these issues before all of a sudden starts thumb sucking again, you know, even though they haven't done it for a while or, or they start wetting themselves again, even though they, they, they were properly, you know, potty trained and they, they, they haven't had the problem for a while, all of a sudden it returns. So if you see a return to an earlier behavior, that's often a sign that this child's under some type of stress. Um, aggression is, is very common. Uh, clinginess, certainly. Uh, behavioral issues. This would be things like having trouble at school that, that, that they never used to experience. That may be a sign that something's really bothering them. Um, and then physical symptoms. And typical physical symptoms are things like stomach aches for a child or, or headaches. You know, um, and and these are sometimes signs of of them feelings uh, an abundance of stress. Um, once you recognize that a child is under stress, you can help them to think about problem solving strategies that might work for them. Um, it's often not the best just to solve the problem for them. I mean, it it, it is best to help them. Uh, you know, depending on the age and whatnot, the child obviously, but it's best if you can help them solve their problem and not just like try to fix everything for them so that they learn problem solving strategies. Uh, and then they, you know, if they, if they're successful in using problem solving strategy, then they're much more likely to, again, you know, at, at a later time. Um, sometimes if you feel like the problem that they have has just been blown out of proportion, like they're really upset or stressed out about something that really isn't a big deal, then then you do a reappraisal with them. Um, you know, you it's you don't fix a problem for them, but you put it in the right perspective. This really, really, really isn't a big deal. Like they might think it is, but if you can convince them, you know that how how it's not a very big deal, how it's not, you know, the end of the world. Um, this will often be, uh, it doesn't eliminate the problem, but it, it is an emotion focused kind of approach. It will soften the blow and, and they will and they'll stop stressing about something once they realize that it's not that important in life. And actually, one of the things good about the, the reappraisal is that this is, I'll tell you for, for myself, this is something, a strategy I've used I, I, throughout my life. I mean, often, I often just do a cognitive reappraisal where I, I decide I'm going to look at things differently, you know, and if I can't do direct problem solving. And so you're teaching the child that, hey, don't worry about every little thing. Like if you if you look and think about it differently, you, you can realize sometimes that what seems like a big deal really isn't. And that's a skill that you can help you lifelong. Okay, and this will conclude the stress and coping section and video one.